deficiency in anemia. So, tell me, what are, what's the most common symptom of anemia? Fatigue. Yeah, fatigue, tiredness, right? Uh, it's a very vague symptom. A lot of people have it. A lot of people have anemia. Right? Um, and so when we look at people with anemia and fatigue, we really want to sort of figure out where they stand and what, um, what the cause of it is. So obviously this easy thing you do is you get a CBC, which ends up, which is usually how you find out they're anemic. Right, their hemoglobin is low, their hematocrit is low. But on the CBC, you get several other things. You get MCV, MCHC, and those. So in iron deficiency anemia, what's your MCV? Low, normal, or high? Corpuscular It's a normal acidic. Is it normal acidic? Is iron deficiency anemia microcytic, normocytic, or microcytic? Microcytic. Micro okay. So your MCV is low. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. okay. So iron deficiency is microcytic. You lack iron, which means you're going to not be able to make as much uh, heme. So your cells are going to be low in volumes, or your mean corpuscular volume is going to be low. Okay. Um, with certain other anemias, you're going to have a macrocytic anemia. Give me examples. B12. The, the yeah. uh, what's it called? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So B12 deficiency. What up? Per oh no, not pernicious. Mm -mm. Pernicious anemia is also macrocytic. Is it macrocytic? Yeah. Um, and then some of the other ones are normocytic. Um, like uh, anemia chronic disease can be normocytic. Um, acute blood loss anemia is normocytic, right? Um, some thalassemia can be normocytic. Um, so, and then sickle cell anemia, uh, what's the hallmark of sickle cell anemia? Shaped in red blood cells. Yeah, so you have the sickle shaped red blood cells on peripheral smear, and your it's not so much the MCV but the RDW that's going to be high, your red cell distribution width, because there's variability in shape and size, right? So that happens when you have a high retic count, which means your body's trying to replace the blood loss, your RDW goes up. It goes up when the cells aren't homogeneous. So if you've got a sickle cell or um, spherocytosis or some of those things, um, it goes up. Um, essentially, they all will give you weakness and fatigue as symptoms, right? Um, more so with acute blood loss anemia. Um, those are probably going to be the most symptomatic because you have no time to compensate. Um, one of the questions that always comes up with anemia is how should you correct it? So obviously number one thing is you want to find the cause and correct the cause. If they're iron deficient, well, give them iron. Now you can be iron deficiency anemia from chronic bleeding. Right? So it's not just low iron intake, but if you, for example, have menorrhagia, if you have a GI bleed, you know, very slow bleeding, um, you have ulcers that tend to lose little bits of blood. You might not really notice it or appreciate the volume, but those things add up, and so common causes of iron deficiency anemia are chronic blood loss. Um, and things like that, okay? Um, we generally look at correction, and we used to say everybody should be corrected to 10, right? Hemoglobin should be over 10, just if your iron is, if you're anemic, you're, you're in the hospital, you're anemic, we give you blood until you're corrected to 10. And there is a big trial that looked at 
blood transfusions and whether or not you should transfuse blood. Mm -hmm. and there's a few issues with giving blood transfusion to correct anemia, right? Mm -hmm. One is obviously the risk of bloodborne infections, which we screen for and it's fairly safe, but nevertheless, it's there. The second is getting the wrong blood type or having a blood reaction or having a reaction to the antibodies in the blood, right? And that's why you do your blood typing and cross-matching and stuff, but you can still have reactions to the things that don't get cross-matched for. And then lastly, it's blood is essentially immunosuppressive. Okay. So it causes people to have a, a diminished immune system response. So if you're giving it to septic patients or patients with infectious diseases, they can get worse. Uh, cancer patients can do poorly um, when you give blood to everybody pretty much blood transfusions are associated with higher mortality uh, the argument that you'll hear is well people who need more blood are sick so they're gonna die right makes sense so higher mortality is an association not a causation so someone did a trial and they looked at liberal versus restrictive blood transfusions. And a liberal blood transfusion protocol was everybody got transfused until their hemoglobin was 10 or higher. And a conservative blood transfusion protocol was everyone got transfused to a hemoglobin of seven or higher, unless they were symptomatic um, or hypotensive or something while their hemoglobin was seven, in which case they would get transfused until they were not symptomatic, okay, or too 10. So they looked at this and they looked at the outcomes and essentially mortality was, is lower in the conservative blood transfusion group than the others because more blood has its associated side effects which then causes more complications. Why is that? That group excluded cardiac patients though, okay? So this is why you'll hear, oh, it's a cardiac patient, go to 10 because they excluded patients with heart disease and stuff. Because imagine someone's got a bad heart and you're gonna not give them the oxygen carrying capacity. They might have an MI. So it was, it was a population that was excluded from the study because they didn't want to have a problem with that population. So we don't know if that data applies to them. So you can't apply the data to them. Why is it that their mortality is higher? Because blood is, you know, suppressive for one thing. Well, why it is causes it suppressive? well because we don't really know the exact mechanisms, but it it may have to do with the fact that you've got immune cells in the blood, right, mm -hmm. from the donor, and so they're gonna try to attack your cells mm -hmm. and your immune system, and that immune system are gonna be battling each other. It's not a big effect. It's not. You know, it's not like a graft versus host, right? Because it's really mostly packed red cells and not a lot of the other stuff. But again, it's not normal substances that are in your own blood. So it does tend to have that effect for some reason. Um, and what were we talking about? Heart. Oh, heart patients, right? So you they're excluded from this population because of their associated risks, so people still are pretty aggressive with giving them blood. Um, some neuro patients, people will argue, need more blood if they've got brain injuries because you need to maintain oxygenation and perfusion. And, and, and obviously, if you've got hypotensive patient or someone with ongoing bleeding or whatnot, you need to transfuse them liberally. But the idea is giving more blood doesn't necessarily mean better outcomes. The other thing is more blood causes more volume issues, so you can go to CHF. Um, blood is associated with um, trolley or transfusion related acute lung injury, right? which is basically an ARDS type picture that follows a blood transfusion. Again, that immunogenic uh, response or reaction towards your tissues. And so there's a lot of downsides potentially to blood transfusions. Um, in 
outpatient settings, you really don't have to deal with that so much because patients are usually sim stable and minimally symptomatic, so you slowly correct them. And so if they're iron deficient, you only give them iron. In sickle cell patients, you just need to avoid things that cause sickle cell crisis, which is like hypoxemia, um, altitude, and those kinds of things. There isn't much you can do other than symptom control and really Sickle cell is a very, very, very painful disease. Um, they, in fact, can infarct their spleen, and so that's very painful, and they'll have an atrophied, infarcted spleen. You don't have to do anything about that. You don't do a, a splenectomy? You don't have to. It basically infarcts and involutes and, and uh -huh. shrivels up um, most of the time. If it's very painful for them and they can't handle it, sometimes they do, but a lot of them, it just infarcts on its own. Um, the B12 or folate deficiencies you replace um, you know, pernicious anemia is a difficult situation because they're lacking intrinsic factor to absorb the B12 so you might have to give them B12 shots instead of um, oral supplementation and stuff. Uh, big problem in gastric bypass patients for example because things are going the other direction um, okay so, clotting factor disorders. So let's talk about that. Um, Before we move on, do you mind if we go over a little bit of the labs, that, like the TIBC we were kind of wondering about, and like what um, will be high, what will be low? Um, like for like, iron deficiency anemia? Yeah, so we have the. So, when you MCB do iron studies, you're going to get your iron level. So, initially on your CBC, you're going to have your MCV which is your biggest thing, it's gonna be low. And normal is 80 to 100, so an iron deficiency anemia, you're gonna be usually in the high 70s or low. Um, and then you can get your iron studies, which is your iron, TIBC, and ferritin. So your iron is obviously gonna be low. Your TIBC will be usually high. Your t so that's your total iron binding capacity because your body is trying to compensate by creating more binding protein to increase your iron stores. Except there is no iron to bind to, so your iron is low and your total capacity is going to be high. Um, that's usually the easiest way to remember that. And then the ferritin? Uh, ferritin, I think, in iron deficiency normal. is normal. Is it? I don't know. Look that one up. I don't remember ferritin exactly. Okay. And what exactly is ferritin again? Ferritin, I think, is another iron binding. Ferritin is how much you stored iron. It's the bound iron, right? Or stored iron. I don't know. Is ferritin the same as the iron binding protein? Is an intracellular protein that stores iron and releases it. It's like your bound or stored iron. Um, now, for thalassemia, so this is something that medicine, I'm not very good at this, but you should look it up. There's a very good way of looking at the proportions of your MCV, MCHC, and your hemoglobin and stuff, and figuring out which type of anemia they have. Like, is it going to be thalassy, beta thal, alpha thal? Yeah, that's thal, what I'm curious about. Like, how do you that. look at that? I don't know it off the so top of my head because I don't really do that very much, but the medicine people do that a lot. Um, so I'm sure if you Google it, there's a little chart yeah. on uh, what the best way to tell those apart is.
types of Bombo brands. Um, there's where you make no Bombo brands, you make defective Bombo brands, or you make low but normal Bombo brands. Okay. Um, and so the distinction is in the ones where you make low or normal. I mean, low but normal amounts, you can give DDAVP, which increases their binding and will kind of correct. But for the patient who makes none or makes defective ones, they will not correct. Because more of the not working von Willebrand's factor won't help. states It's 
abnormal, you become hypercoagulable. Okay. But when it's normal, it yeah. is part of the cascade. But if, when it becomes abnormal, it doesn't function, right? It's, it can't be inactivated, like you said. So then it continuously, it promotes coagulation. But it's not a procoagulant factor, right? I mean, it's a procoagulant factor. When it becomes abnormal, it can't be inactivated. Uh, protein C and protein S are anticoagulants, essentially, right? They're natural inhibitor or mechanisms to undo the clotting cascade. The problem is with protein C and S deficiency, if you're deficient in them, the system will then run without having a check, and so you're hypercoagulable when you have a deficiency in protein C and S. Sense. Um, factor V laden tends to, for some reason, have a lot of arterial thrombus, whereas protein CNS patients tend to have venous thrombuses. Um, so, more so DVTs versus factor V laden people getting like arterial occlusions and ischemic lens and stuff. And how do you treat them? much, make them stop. What's the oldest and cheapest? Aspirin is an anti-what? Platelet. Platelet? Right, it's not an anti-coagulant. Pepper? Or warfarin? Warfarin. So warfarin's cheap and, you know, rat poison, you get it in buckets. Okay. Um, you gotta know what warfarin gets its name from. Oh, did I tell you already? I can't I'm going to go ahead and make a guess here. Go ahead. The war, there's a lot of bleeding. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's warf that we make our hat. Oh. Hi. Ooh, the shop's up. I'll take it. Okay, so, um, warfarin is, comes from the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. And they basically found out that if you give this stuff to rats, they're, they hemorrhage in their brain and die. Uh, great rat for you. And then they figured out why it works and said, oh, we can use this in here. Titrate to the right amount of poison and then they'll hopefully not bleed to that in their heads, which is what happens when people have too much come in. Right? They spontaneously bleed with intracranial hemorrhages, intra-abdominal hemorrhage, or anywhere where they can just breathe. They bump into a table and then they start breathing. And they get in a car accident and then they hemorrhage. Um, yeah, but that's, that or, you know, heparin or lovinox can all be used as a good anticoagulant. Uh, so now there's all these new drugs that are approved for this function, but I'm sure people are going to try to use them for this. Um, let's see if we can get some urology stuff done too. I'm trying to hit the high topics here. Okay, so BPH, what is it? Big prostate, right? What happens with age predominantly? Does it affect men or women? 100%. Um, is it is it cancerous? No, it's but in a large prostate, you have to make sure it's not a prostate cancer. But what is what's the typical symptom of an enlarged prostate? So frequency, weak flow, feeling like you're not completely empty, right? um, and weak streaks. Um, Prostate cancer can have some of the same symptoms, but doesn't necessarily cause the obstructive symptoms as much. So that's another thing. A big prostate that's not causing obstructive symptoms is kind of more problematic. Uh, do you do PSA for screening for prostate cancer? Not specific. Okay, so you guys should remember this. PSA is 
specific to prostate, but not specific to prostate cancer. It goes up with prostatitis or inflammation or infection of the prostate. Basically, any things where there is irritation or enlargement of the prostate, there's more prostate tissue, there's more PSA. PSA is great for following patients who have prostate cancer. So if they start off with a high PSA, for example, and then they get radiation or something and their prostate shrivels up and their PSA drops, then you can use that number as a as annual monitor. And if it goes, starts going back up, then you gotta think, okay, maybe something's coming back and we have to do more testing, like a PET scan or whatnot, okay? So it's, it's a tumor marker, but it's not a screening test for prostate cancer. What's the screening test for prostate cancer? Essentially, infection of the kidney, 
treated with antibiotics. If it's really bad, you can get sepsis. Sometimes you have to drain it with a, if they get an abscess next to the kidney or something. If they're not like abscess or something. Um, but that's usually from just not treating their UTI and not treating their pyelonephritis for a while. Uh, typical symptoms of pyelonephritis are Blank pain and CDA tendon and stomach pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, what else can cause blank pain? Kidney stones. Kidney stones, good. And do they have CDA tendon? Okay. Shouldn't. Okay. And the pain usually radiates down towards the groin. Uh, and it, they can either pass the stone or it can get stuck and cause hydroureter. Kidney stones that are not causing swelling of the ureter and hydro-ureter hydrosalpings, which is swelling of the renal pelvis, do not cause pain. Because the pain is from the obstruction and dilation. If the stone just passes through, doesn't cause a blockage, they shouldn't have pain. Okay. What are, what's a typical test finding in someone who has kidney stone? What test would you do? UA? Yes, and what would you see on the UA? You can, you can uh, strain the urine if you think they're passing stones and catch it and then test it and see what kind of stone it is. But on a standard UA, what do you see? You see blood. It'll be blood positive, right? So hematuria is common because the stone's like ripping up the urine. And Obviously not like gross hematuria. Usually it's microscopic hematuria, but it's a common cause. The common cause of it is kidney stones. Okay. Um, what's a hydrocele?
rush them to the operating room, emerge, and then, right? Uh, and you go untwist the testicle, and then you stitch it in two sides so that it doesn't twist again. Then attach it to the screw so that it doesn't spin back around. So it's, so it's detorsion and then a fixation. Uh, what's epididymitis? Typically, it's infectious and it's treated with antibiotics. It's usually like uh, STD related. Okay. Uh, and they also may have uh, discharge. Um, Acidosis for critical care or acute hyperglycemia. So, if a diabetic patient comes in and their blood sugar is really high, what's usually the problem? What happens to them? No. So, what's, what's wrong with having really high blood sugars acutely? We know the chronic issues, right? You get vascular problems, kidney problems, vision problems, blah, blah, blah. blah. But why can't I just go on a really good binge today? Just have all the cake at the bakery. And then tomorrow I'll just get back under control. Or I just, like, don't carry my insulin around today. So, hyperglycemia can cause coma. is their blood sugar goes up but they can't use any of the sugar they have no they don't have the insulin to use up that sugar so the body can't get its energy stores so they're going to go into ketosis typically they're going to try to go into starvation mode and go into muscle breakdown and ketosis to use ketones as their source of energy because they can't use all the abundant glucose that's floating everywhere but all that glucose is there and it's very hyperosmolar and so it causes you also to urinate a lot and get dehydrated at the same time. So they get dehydrated, they get all the osmotic effects of the fluid shifts from the hyperosmolar or hyperglycemia and they have a lack of energy available to the rest of their body so they're ketotic which means they're acidotic. So typically what happens is you get hyperglycemic and then you can get hyperglycemic non-ketoacidosis and then you can get hyperglycemic ketoacidosis which is diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA. So in DKA they're acidotic and they have or don't have an NIM gap. Do you know what I mean? No. Mm -hmm. They do have a gap. Oh, they do. Okay. Um, and so you'll see their CO2 is really low, they're acidotic, so their potassium is going to be higher. Than so that acid can come out, right? Well, what if you have a bunch of acid instead? Acid goes into the cell, potassium comes out. So they can become hyperkalemia. Okay, and so as you replace, as you fix them, their potassium can change, right? Their potassium shifts back. Um, so, and they'll be dehydrated, so you have to give them volume, you have to give them insulin, They'll have pseudo hyponatremia. Remember the correction for that? 
is for every 100 that the glucose is over 100, your sodium drops by 2. So the measured sodium is going to be 2 lower than the actual sodium. So if you have a blood sugar of 600, that's 500 above 100, right? That's 500, so 2 times each of the hundreds, that's 2 times 5 is 10. So the sodium would really be 10 more than what you're measuring on your lab. So if they give you a sodium measurement on your chemistry of 125, the real sodium would be 135 once you correct their hyperglycemia. Um, so this is one of the ways diabetics die in the acute setting. That's why people are always like, oh my god, that so and so is a diabetic and they're wandering off or lost or kidnapped or whatever and they don't have their insulin. Right? They'll get comatose and then die and they can't get any Symptoms are usually pain, like dizziness, altered mood and mental status, dehydration, weakness, acidosis, and everything else that goes with it. What's okay. painful? Um, they get a lot of cramps mm -hmm. everywhere, like the GI tract hurts, everything hurts. Mm -hmm. A lot of belly pain, particularly. presents with an acute GI bleed, what's the first thing you want to do? Well, the first thing you want to do is give them some fluids and volume, right? You want to check and see if they're anemic. Are they likely to be anemic? Why not? Yeah, because you bleed whole blood, right? So the concentration of your hemoglobin doesn't change because you bleed whole blood. It will, they'll be anemic after you resuscitate them. After you give them a bunch of fluid mm -hmm. and then it equilibrates and then they are going to, that hemoglobin is going to equilibrate and they're going to be low and they're going to be anemic. That's just my life. Um, so they'll be anemic. And, but I mean, they won't be anemic 
initially they'll be anemic after you resuscitate and, no, and then you have to give them blood to keep up with their ongoing bleeding. Typically, yeah, if you know they're having massive bleeding, you'll just keep giving them blood. You want to make sure that they're, mo they're on monitored beds, that they're um, adequately resuscitated as far as blood pressure goes and volume, and yeah, then you want to find the source of the so, what's the best way to find the source of the bleeding? First thing is you want to get their history and find out what their history is. So, is this a cirrhotic patient? Do they have a coagulopathy? Do they have any known GI problems like ulcer disease, varices, previous GI bleeds, diverticulosis, um, tumors in their GI tract, or anything that's known, or recent surgeries? Are they on a bunch of blood thinners? Are they on antiplatelets? Are they taking a bunch of NSAIDs that's likely to cause an ulcer that's like make them bleed? Okay. And you also want to look at where's the blood coming from? Is it likely coming from above or below? Now, upper GI bleeds that are before the pylorus usually present with vomiting blood. But if it's in the duodenum or distal, they may not vomit any blood because if the pylorus is intact, that blood won't reflux back into the stomach, it'll just go forward. And so they can have hematochesia if it's a brisk bleed or melanin if it's a slow bleed. Okay. Do you go to surgery? To fix it. thing to do is either do endoscopy, if they're stable enough, or angiography. So if you do endoscopy, you go upper or lower and find the source of the bleeding. Upper is easy to do, even if they're bleeding, right? And then you can actually see an ulcer or a bleeding vessel or a varices or something. You can clip it or inject it and intervene and try to stop it. And you get the diagnosis and you can actually Colonoscopy is a little bit more difficult because blood's coming down and you didn't do a prep or anything, right? So the GI doctor goes, oh, I gotta prep them. And the answer is no, you don't prep them because they're bleeding to death. So there's no time to prep for one. For two, blood is cathartic. The blood is prepping. And three, you're not looking for tiny little polyps. You're looking for massive bleeding. So you just keep going up until you get to a point where there's massive bleeding. And then at least you know the region that the bleeding is in. Uh, so you tell me it's in the right colon. I'll take out half the colon. I know I'll get the bleeding. Okay? Tell me it's in the colon. I can take out like, the entire colon if I have to. But I know it's in the colon. I'll get it. If you can't tell me if it's in the stomach, the esophagus, the small intestine, or the colon, I can't take out the entire colon. Um, the other thing you can do is do angiography when you do an angiogram of the mesenteric blood vessels. So the celiac, the SMA, and you try to get to their branches and see if there's a vessel that's blushing, which is where it doesn't taper at a capillary, but it just seems like it just bursts in into a pool of blood. Um, that usually means that's a blood vessel that oozing into a into a cavity as opposed to into a capillary. And so they can actually embolize that vessel or mark it with nothing blue or, you know, or at least tell you what which vessel it was. They can tell you if it's the SMA or the IMA, is it the right colic or the left colic? Is it the off the celiac? Is it the gastroduodenal? You know, where is it? And they may be able to even get control of it, but at least you'll know. The key is you got to find out where it's bleeding from. Okay. 